here with the one and only Tony Miola. Uh, Tony, I appreciate you taking the time. I just want to let you know, um, a lot of guys ask, you know, who, who's the guy you watched growing up? Uh, for me, it was you and, and a few others, obviously, but um, you were the, the guy at the World Cup, all that good stuff. So it is uh, a complete honor. And also, you're the reason I tried to grow a ponytail out. Um, and that, that's, <laughs> How'd that work out? <laughs> it was a disaster. Um, never again, except for maybe quarantine. It's headed that direction. Uh, yeah, that's where I'm at now. But anyway, it's good to talk to you, man. I, I appreciate the invite and uh, looking forward to, to chatting for a little bit. Yeah, I'm not going to take up too much of your time, as I know you do about a thousand of these a day. But um, but I just I really appreciate it. I want to get into just you grew up in New Jersey. Um, what what it was like at the youth level um, for a goalkeeper back then? Was there a lot of training? And then how did you kind of come up uh, through through your high school years? Yeah, so um, funny, funny you ask. There's a, a documentary that's out right now that just came out on YouTube that was supposed to be launched at the film festival, but obviously things have changed. It's called Soccer Town USA. And the reaction has been incredible because I think what people are seeing in that is a soccer city in the 80s that was just soccer mad. Um, we played day and night. It was the, really the only thing to do. Of course, I played a couple other sports when I was a kid, but you know, one of my old teammates uh, from high school summed it up pretty well when he was asked about sort of what is it like where I grew up. And he said, you know what, in, in New Jersey where we grew up, we played soccer three times before we went to training. We played before school. We played at lunchtime and we played after school. And then we went to training a couple nights a week, you know. And, and um, as a young goalkeeper, we didn't have goalkeeper coaches. You know, the, 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 the landscape of goalkeeping um, – is 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 completely different and it has been completely different for excuse me for a, a couple of years now and i look at it and i i wonder sometimes as much as i think goalkeeper coaching is great and and everything that I learned from guys like militant soskich and joe macknick and tim mulqueen and, and guy I, I wonder sometimes if that was just refining the position instead of learning how to compete and loving the position. Because I, for me personally, if I would have had it at a really young age, I probably would have, would have loved it. Um, uh, but I, I think maybe, um, I think maybe having it later in my career, I kind of, I yearned for it every day. I didn't have it. It was like a new toy having a goalkeeper coach yeah. when I finally got to, to college, you know, and that was really my first um, time I ever had a goalkeeper coach. And, it was um, it was myself and, and my best friend, Sal Rosamelia. Um, we used to stay after training, and we called it DIM. And, you know, people ask all the time. We've, we've spoken about this for years. We called it DIM. It was dirt in mouth. We had, we had um, a dirt area that nobody was using after training. We weren't allowed on the field after training. And, you know, guys would come, and whatever grass we had left in our field, we had to kind of – preserve and Sal and I went and did dim drills after training he was a goalkeeper as well my best friend and we kind of there was Chris Pete who played in Wichita who was a Carney Thistle guy growing up and had a professional career played with the youth national team we used to do Chris Pete drills that we would see him do and that was really it but like I think no different than sort of creative players when you read about the Messies and they talk about oh, we, we played in the streets all day when we were kids you watch all these documentaries and and that our goalkeeper training was no different than that. We were just two kids kind of on the street figuring it out on our own. And then it was kind of, I don't know if goalkeeper coaches for me was sort of validation um, that we were doing it right or, or just, <clears throat> excuse me, a refinement of, <clears throat> excuse me, Andy, a refinement of, of doing what we had done for years. And here, here's the product of talking for seven hours a day on the radio right now. Uh, you got almost no voice left, but that that's what it was for me. Um, and at a young age, I think I like the fact, and, and I love when I go to the field and I see kids on the sideline and they're kind of, they're kind of throwing a ball to each other and diving around and figuring out how to tuck their arm in and all the sort of the technical stuff. And then, you know, guys like you come who have played at the highest level and, now you can show them really how to refine it. But they've already kind of developed the mentality about the position because I've always said this is not a position where 
you can't get thrown into this position, right? This, this is a love or hate. You either love being a goalkeeper. There, there's no hating being a goalkeeper because if you hate being a defender, well, you got a chance to be a fullback. You got a chance to be a midfielder. You got a chance to be center forward. You got other options. When you're stuck back there, this is your only option. That's, yeah, that's well said. I mean, it is uh, – even, even during my youth, there was – I had to go to uh, summer camps to get goalkeeper training for the most part. Um, so it, it was more or less just go dive around, figure it out. But there was always that love there for some reason. I just wanted to be in the goal rather than, well, I didn't like running either. Uh, probably, you know, a lot of goalkeepers say that, yeah. but, uh, there, there was just something about that. But, um, your, your high school years, it's interesting because if I'm not mistaken, you were drafted to play for the Yankees out of high school. So you played baseball and I think basketball as well. Yeah, and I also I, I played as a center forward my senior year of high school um, because our our starting center forward, who was a Portuguese kid, gotten into a car accident about a week before the season and um, was eventually okay, uh, but it took him quite some time to sort of recover from his injuries. And um, our coach likes we, – we were the number one team in the state, and our coach said, you know, what are we going to do? This this guy's going to be a top scorer in the state. Does anyone, does anyone want to play center forward? And I was like – I got you, coach. You know, we had Sal, my best friend, who was also an all-state yeah. goalkeeper. And uh, it was the two of us who were the all-state goalkeepers. We both played for the same high school team. He went on to play at Columbia University and then a little bit professionally in the, in the, uh, the uh, USISL when it was there. And I believe the, um, the uh, ASL, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, um, I just it – was, it was a moment to get away. I just come from the youth national teams, and I'm like, this, this is going to be fun. And I had a blast doing it. And I got to tell you, when I – when I eventually got to the point where playing with your feet sort of in 92 and 93, when the rule was changing, it started to become really, really important before the 94 world cup. Um, I was ready. I, I was, I was, I was way ahead of the game because of that year in high school. Um, you know, and you, you go back to the, the coaching and I, I think what, what ends up happening and what guys like you who coach, I, I use the word sort of refining, you know, you, you refine things, you take the things that these kids learn at a young age, and then you make it more efficient for them. So their diving is good, but how do you make it better? How do you make their footwork better? How do you get their hands in position quicker? Um, all those little things are what, what guys like you around the country are doing, which allows us to hopefully just continue to produce uh, good young goalkeepers year in and year out. Yeah, I think that's a great point is just, um, I kind of did the same thing, but not at the high school level. At the club level, I always played on a team just with my feet on the field. Um, and my coach always stressed that. And I, I really think that uh, set me um, in a good spot to, to learn the modern game, playing with your feet. No um, doubt, yeah. How did you say no to the Yankees? Well, when I – so the draft was a little bit different uh, back then. I was a big I mean, baseball fan, baseball player. Um, you know, b half of my scholarship actually at the University of Virginia was a baseball scholarship. So I played two sports in college, and that was really I, – I never thought that the soccer thing was going to be the route, to be honest. I never thought that – I always felt like I was so far away, and I always felt like from freshman year when scouts were coming to watch me in baseball, I just felt – a little bit closer to the end product. You know, I love the game. I still love it. Now, one who plays, I have one son who plays college baseball. Well, now his, his last year got sort of taken yeah. away. So we're just kind of fingers crossed with the draft. And, yeah. and then I've got a younger, that's a, a junior that's going to Oklahoma state to play. And um, we, we have baseball in our family. We love the game. I love it. I love the eye hand coordination. I love the tactics of the game and I loved it back then. And, um, I was actually in Chile at the Youth World Cup when I found out about getting drafted. I was rooming with Casey Keller at the time, and uh, it, back then it was different because there was a high school draft, there was a, a college draft, there was an international draft. It was all kind of separated, um, and I, I don't I I always wanted to be the first kid in my uh, family to go to college. That was my goal. I'm first generation in America. It was always a dream of mine to go to college. I ended up leaving college early. So yeah, I didn't junior. fulfill that part. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, but, but it was, uh, it was not an easy decision, but I knew that I still was going to play baseball at the university of Virginia. Um, so it was going to fulfill that part of, uh, 
um, sort of my dream moving forward. And then when we qualified for the World Cup, that was it. I left the University of Virginia. So I played my last game in college was the NCAA championship in, um, I guess that was 1989. And that was against Santa Clara, the last uh, so the last uh, dual champions that have ever been crowned, there was no shootout. Um, oh. And it, it was the coldest, I believe, up until a couple of years ago. There might have been a colder event, but I don't remember seeing it. Up, up until a couple of years ago, it was still the coldest NCAA event ever played outdoor. Colder than football games. We're at Rutgers. It was like 19 below yeah. zero. Um, and we ended up drawing Santa Clara, go to overtime, which was like the worst thing you wanted to do on a day like that. Um, and we were co-champions after that. They went to penalty kicks after uh, in college. That's insane. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that got to be kind of anticlimactic. It's just to uh, have a draw at the end. And then, Andy, I, I was yeah. so happy. I got to tell you, I, I couldn't stay another minute on the field. I was That's amazing. My, yeah, you know what, off man. It that, was that, <laughs> that reminds me of the 2013 MLS Cup. Uh, I was sitting in the stands watching uh, Sporting win it. Uh, RSL, is that the, I was there. The RSL game, is that the yeah, one? Yeah, RSL game. And yeah, I yeah. remember being in the stands like, there's no way I'd want any part of this game. It's so cool. You might remember, um, I, I certainly did. There was a play that a ball got deflected, and it went the opposite way. Jimmy Nielsen was in goal. Couldn't move. And he looked like he was completely frozen. Yeah. It looked like a frozen tree just yeah. falling just at that point. I think it hit the post, right, maybe? But it, I remember it, him trying to change gone. direction. Yeah. I'm like, the, the man is literally frozen. Yeah. He can't move right now. I, it was amazing. I was so cold, and we were sitting in a box. I'm like, uh, but what a good night it turned out to be for, for sports. Yeah, that was a great moment. I was out of contract with Columbus, and I was like, all right, if, uh, if sporting wins this, maybe Jimmy Nielsen retires. And maybe I can get to uh, come back home, and it worked <laughs> I, out. Right. I was in I was in the stands thinking the same thing. Yours worked out, mine didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So so then yeah, you go on um, to play at Virginia, and like you said, two sport uh, two sport baseball, soccer. You won um, you won the Herman Trophy, which is the best player in college your freshman year. Uh, that was my sophomore year. Okay, sophomore um, year. I, yeah, sophomore year after we won that uh, national championship, and then I, I left after that. And the funny thing about um, – I don't know if it's funny. It's just an odd fact. I, so I did not win goalkeeper of the year that year. So I won national player of the year, but the Adidas goalkeeper of the year um, was went to Anton Nissel, who was the goalkeeper – of UCLA at the time, really good goalkeeper, was in the national team system for uh, quite a while because they only awarded it to seniors. Oh. So I, I won national player of the year, both the Herman and the Mac award and the goalkeeper of the year I didn't win. So I've ne I never won a college goalkeeper of the year. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, that, it's incredible though. So at what point did you realize, was it because uh, you guys had qualified for the 94 yeah. World Cup? And then that was that it. Was, you were all in. Yeah, that was it. That was the moment I realized that. And of course, things were kind of leading that way. Like I started to realize, look, Virginia was number one pretty much every week that I was in college, except when we lost to Howard the first year in in uh, in double overtime at home. I think that was the quarterfinals of the NCA. Uh, but the entire year we were in first, uh, for number one in the country. Pretty much the entire year, our second year, we were number one in the country. And and I kind of felt the momentum uh, of you know, the national team getting closer. Um, you know, my, my game was starting to look like I could become a pro, uh, where in baseball it didn't look that way. It didn't look like I was. So m sort of my plan was, was backwards, or, was, or at least was going backwards a little bit. And then that was it. Well, of course, once we qualified for the World Cup for the – the first time in 40 years, um, yeah. you know, I was kind of sold. And then I, I left, I, I left, I went right to England from there. Um, and then just dealt with the work permit problem after work permit problem. Not, it's not, it wasn't then like it is now. It was so difficult. Um, and, uh, then eventually we signed, um, uh, with U.S. soccer to become full-time, basically residents as a team. Sure. Um, and that's kind of what the pathway was almost waiting for the league to coincide with that World Cup, right? I mean, it was right there. Was yeah. There. Well, the league was supposed to remember. We ended in 94 in June was the World Cup, and I had offers to go pretty much everywhere um, from South America, Botafogo. I, went, I actually went to Botafogo because I really wanted to go to South America at that time. My dream 
growing up, as much as I'm an AC Milan fan, my dream, I knew I wasn't going to be able to play in Italy because I had tried for four years to get my passport. And I, I was four months born four months too late to get my passport because my parents in particular, my mom uh, had her, her passport changed four months before I was born uh, to become an American citizen. They couldn't have dual citizenship. So my sister who's four years older than me can become an an Italian citizen tomorrow. I couldn't, uh, which was a really odd rule. But anyway, my, my dream was to play at Boca, but I was a Boca junior fan. Um, I, as a kid, got turned on to Boca Junior uh, River Plate Derbies um, in the Bombonera, and, and that was my dream. So I was, I was, I considered the Botafogo. I considered going to Medellin <laughs> uh, to play in Colombia, and yeah. U.S. Soccer nixed the deal. I literally, I'll tell you a funny story. I, I literally was in a hotel lobby in a Radisson Mart Hotel in Miami, the one we used to stay at all the time. We play Colombia at and. Um, what was the name of this team? The Orange Bowl. Yeah. And I come back from the Orange Bowl and I'm walking with Sunil Galati. And, and they've got these double doors, you know, kind of a little lobby and then doors to get into the hotel. And here comes the, the delegation from Columbia. And these guys stop us like literally between the two double doors and say, we need to speak. I'm like, oh yeah, let's speak. And, and on the spot, they offer me $20,000 a month. This is 1989. They offered me 20000 And I'm a kid from New Jersey. I'm like, yeah. man, I haven't made $20,000 working in the bakery I was working at for three years, you know, total, uh, making $100 a week in the summers, you know. And, uh, and the U.S. soccer basically talked me out of it. I didn't know the political issues that were going on down there. I didn't know about the cartels and, and everything that was sort of rumored about what was happening down there. Uh, but I was ready literally to go the next day. And, and then I, I went to Botafogo. We had a deal worked out. Um, and then at the end, <laughs> it was one of those things. We spent we spent five or six weeks, and Coca-Cola was involved at that time, and they were a sponsor there, and you know, obviously the American Connection and all of that stuff. And um, when we finally got the, the contract, it said something completely different <laughs> than what we had talked about for five or six weeks. And you can imagine some of the things that were in there. And I'm like, sure. yeah, I don't think this is a good idea either. But that, that was kind of what was happening. Um, and I decided to stay after the World Cup because the league was supposed to start in March of yeah. 1995 and then got the late a year. And that's kind of was that gap year that I had to, uh, I went and played with the Long Island Rough Riders with Alfonso Mandela, which was great. That had a bunch of MLS guys on it. Is that, so a couple things uh, going back. When, were you a Guillermo Barascoloto fan, um, obviously following Boca? Um, I, I was, as a player, I was, yeah. And I just watched the Dots funny over this break. I finally got to sit down and watch the six part series when he's the manager there in 2018 yeah. and they win, um, they, they win, uh, the, the, the league, um, and kind of just another refresher of what sort of the atmosphere is like and down there and with Kansas city two years in a row, Bob Gansler took us to Argentina for preseason. Oh, nice. So the first year we went and we watched Boca River Derby in the Bombonera. And then the following year, we watched the Derby at River Plate's place. And by far, uh, Bombonera was so much better, so much more intense. Um, Maradona was in the stadium at the time and they were just, I mean, literally people were crying on their knees every time he walked out from his little, uh, so down to our left across the stadium from us, we could see him in those boxes. He was like the second one from, from the left. And I mean, when he came out, people just fell to their, I never seen anything like him. They fell to their knees. They were crying. They were chanting to him for forever before the game and during the game. And you would have never known Boca lost three, nothing at home. Um, that game and they were still chanting like mad. So I, it's, it's on my bucket list to my kids that one day, uh, before I die, they need to come with me to a Boca river game at the, at the moment era. Yeah, it was, I never understood that rivalry. I wasn't, um, at that point in my life, wasn't a student of the game as, as I am now. Um, or, you know, when I became a pro, but, uh, playing with Guillermo, talking to him about that, what it meant. And, and then seeing a little bit from that uh, Netflix, I believe it's on Netflix that you're talking about 
Yeah, it's yeah. insane. And Guillermo, he, he actually it might be on uh, Amazon Prime. Now, oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah, whichever. Yeah. Um, he can't. He he basically cannot go anywhere in Argentina without without being mobbed. I mean, so he loved it in Columbus. I mean, it was just a different lifestyle. But yeah, and you think about Kansas City. When I got there, one of my best friends, or became one of my best friends, was Mo Johnston. Yeah. And if you know that story, and if you know the Celtic Ranger, I went to see Celtic Ranger um, uh, a cup final at Hamden. Uh, whew, I can't remember what year that was. Mo wasn't playing. Um, and then Mo got his tickets one time to see England, Scotland in Hamden Park because anyone who's played for Scotland gets, uh, gets their seats, you know, for every game. Myself and an- another guy that I was playing with uh, went to see that game. Um, but if you know the story of Mo Johnston and how that all went, and the, the Ranger Celtic, of course, now it's changed a little bit, although it's heating up again. But, you know, to win a period of time when the Rangers got relegated, um, that it changed. But that that's a rivalry. If you can get to see that one, that yeah. one is intense as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and he played on both sides, didn't he? Well, that's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's why Mo probably lives in the U.S. still right yeah. now, right? There's probably exactly. still some angry I mean, been There's been players that have done it um oh. since then yeah um but uh yeah there's been uh th- there's been a few but yeah back then religion was so strong in both of those clubs a catholic club and a protestant club and you really didn't cross lines but i i talked to mo for for two years about um that whole story and how it went down and how his brothers you know had issues when they went out the night that he came from france when he came from lahar i mean it's an amazing amazing story um Again, I was doing all of this stuff, traveling around to these games. I was really studying goalkeepers, but I, I, I really wanted to, um, you know, to see the atmospheres in these places. But I went to games when I was when I was in England at Brighton. I went to see Peter Shilton play. I went to see Neville Southall play. I was at Neville Southall's sit down game when he sat down on the post and, wow. and young goalkeepers go he, at halftime. He, I don't know if it was over contract, but he sat down, didn't go in the locker room, sat with his back against the post. I happened to be there. Um, I went to see Casey Keller when I was in, when he was at Millwall, you know, like I, I always took my time to try and go and see these things while I had the opportunities, but I was all about studying goalkeepers um, back in the day because we didn't have, sure. you, you probably came, when you probably started thinking about being a pro and, and that whole sort of time period, you could see a lot of games on TV at that time, at least enough to, enough. to learn about goalkeeping. When I went um, to, I went to every single Wiz, then Wizards game, we had season tickets. So, so you didn't learn anything while you were there. That was well, a thing, I mean, right? <laughs> you know, whatever the case may be, I learned a little bit. I learned, you know, um, but yeah, it was, uh, I, I remember, you know, I would just go there. I would watch the goalkeepers. Um, you know, I, the conversation I had with Evan Bush was, you know, he never knew to emulate a goalkeeper that fit his profile. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I, you know, like I said, I would step out on the soccer field after watching a guy like yourself play, puff my chest out, realize I'm not as big as this dude. I should probably, uh, you know, watch a smaller frame dude play thinking about that. But, uh, it's, it's really interesting. Like you said, you could watch a little bit more study a little bit more, um, and kind of find who you are as a goalkeeper now. It's a lot yeah, and, and I was really always interested because the one thing that you never saw on TV, whether you, and you don't see a lot of it, is how goalkeepers, just because of the way they film games, how goalkeepers organize. And I think if, if you probably sat down with most of the defenders that I played with, um, that became my strength. And when I got older, um, it saved me to play a couple of years because my theory was if I can organize you in a way, I got to do less work. I'm getting yeah. older. I can't do all this work. Um, and I can't, I certainly can't athletically th- do the things that I did when I was five or six years younger. Um, uh, but I can keep you organized all the time. And Bob Gansler, um, you know, we, we had this discussion years later. He, he's like, did you ever notice? I never as defend as defensive of a, as a team that we may have been, we only worked on attacking things. And I used to, I said to him, you know, people always used to say that team that won the championship, they were a defensive team. They had all the shutouts. What people don't realize is that we were the third highest scoring team in the league. So it's not yeah. like we were in the middle of the pack. Sure. We we're the third highest scoring team in the league with Miklos Molnar and, and Mo Johnston and, and uh, Bunbury and all those guys that we had. And he said, I left you alone. And I never realized it. 
uh, I yeah. never, never realized until years after I was done that he said, I knew you were organizing things. And then ahead, obviously, Peter Vermes, who's just a natural organizer. Carrie Zavagnin, who's a natural organizer. Guys like that, that could take a rookie like Nick Garcia and take a young player on the left side like Brandon Perdot and put them all together. Um, you know, and, and then we had two workhorses, and I knew this with Chris Henderson on the left side and Chris Klein on the right side. And I knew every time I would ask them to tuck back in or make a run back 30, 40 yards to, to sort of sit in that back line, I never had to look again. I never had to look over my shoulder. So it became really, really easy. And then I, I would go through, I've carries a Vagnin to probably tell you that I had, I had this progression. And the first guy that I organized all the time was Kerry Zavagnin. He sat right in front of that back three. So when the ball turned over, I knew if I could get him on the ball, the rest of the guys could recover, yeah. you know, easily. And then I, I went through a progression. I always say from a young goalkeeper standpoint, the last guy – so if the ball – if the play breaks down on our left side of the field, mm -hmm. the, last, the last thing I, you should have to organize is the left side of the field because the ball really dictates – you know, organizing. So if you're the left-sided fullback or the left-sided midfielder uh, or someone, someone that's tucked in on that side, you already know you got you to gotta go close the ball down. Like, I don't really have to tell you that. So I never spent any time organizing where the ball was. I was always organizing where the ball might go next and, and things over people's shoulders, you know. And it just kind of worked for me. So I went through a progression, organized number six, organized the, the weak side fullback, Peter was always organized in general, you know, and, and maybe every now and then you had to tell him to do something, but rarely did you have to. And then everything else kind of fell in place. I think that's a really great point because I, you hear a lot of young goalkeepers that are finding their voice and they say things like no shot or pressure, right? Well, yeah, obviously. I think it's just, it's just a natural thing where, you know, you're learning how to be a, a communicator, a leader. Mm -hmm. And really and truthfully, like you said, everyone understands that you don't want them to get a shot off of the ball. You want there to be pressure on the ball. What's going to happen next is if the weak side is, is uh, asleep, man, that ball gets played through. Now there's a chance. Yeah. And the, the other, the other important thing, and this happens and you probably see this quite a bit with young goalkeepers. And I, I say, every word you say has to mean something, right? And what I mean by that. When I've had young goalkeepers, when the ball turns over and they pass over there, pass over here, at, at, then it's like the boy who cried wolf. Then no one listens to you if you talk the entire game. So every time you talk, it needs to be where people react. If you talk for 90 minutes, like I always thought when we had the ball, that really wasn't my time. That's not what I'm getting paid to do, right? That's, that's other guys' issues. Um, and what I was always looking at was – when is the ball about to turn over? Because that's when I turn my volume up, right? That's when I become the communicator. Um, and, and for me, it worked. Um, and then, of course, as you get older, and you probably realize this too, people just trust you more, right, when you're doing it a little bit more, when you've got games under your belt. So they, they, when you're young, yeah, guys might turn around. You might have a discussion. Hey, why did you want me tucked in over here? Well, because I saw this guy after a while – you know, you tell somebody to tuck in or, or cover somebody, they just do it. They don't really ask questions. And that's, that's ultimately where the Tim Howards of the world, I mean, the great goalkeepers of the world, they're all in that, in that moment, right, in their okay. career. But, but with regards to the communication, make, I guess that would be my recommendation to young goalkeepers is make the communication count. You don't want them ever to zone you out, but they need to know that you're there. Right. Absolutely. So pick, pick and choose your moments. Uh, and it's really important. Sometimes, uh, again, you probably see this. It's not an easy thing for young goalkeepers. Some of them, they're really good, but they're not, not really confident um, in maybe how, you know, speaking to other kids. Maybe they're, they're not confident in, in the tactics uh, because you spend so much time learning how to dive right and learning how to kick a ball and learning how to take a cross. Well, you got to sit back there and spend time and learn how to, communicate with your defenders is equally as important Absolutely. right and how to talk to them they need to know your voice um all that stuff and and um I, I, that's that's as important as anything because if you can't get guys to in front of you to do things well you, you can have a long night some nights absolutely and, and they're at that like 
that really awkward age where no one wants to accept responsibility. Everyone's turning around and it's just, you know, realizing, Hey, you know, we're all on the same page, building those relationships, learning how to lead a little bit. Um, I want to know, because I, I played for Peter, um, you know, and then when I retired, I was with the, uh, I was coaching the Academy goalkeepers. We had, there was like a men's league game that uh, the staff played in where we played this like, Oh, I can't remember this team that came over there was competing in some world men's league championship in Vegas or something. It was a bunch of Hungarian guys, you know, that came over and they were good. Uh, mm -hmm. Peter was my center back. I've never been more intimidated in my life. And that was just in a men's league game. What was it like playing with that guy, uh, you know, in front of you? Um, one night, people have asked me this, but one night sticks out for me. And that was the opening night of 2000 when, when everyone came to that team. Peter had just come to the team. Um, Bob Ganser decided we were going to play with three in the back based on who we had. And um, we ended up winning opening night against Chicago, who was supposed to be the best team in the league. We ended up playing them all the way in the final. So we yeah, opened up with them, and then we ended with them. They also broke our 13-game unbeaten streak at the beginning of the season. I think it was 3-2 uh, two or 2-1, two something in, in uh, Soldier Field. And we won 4-3. And it was a little bit sloppy, and we, we got a gift of a goal um, from the Chicago goalkeeper and all that stuff. And everyone was pretty excited. And Peter absolutely laid into us after the game. And I realized then that that's what leaders do, right? It's, it's easy to yell when things are going poorly for you, and sometimes a team needs that, there's no doubt. Peter knew when to, um, when to get honest to make sure that we weren't um, – we weren't taking our foot off the pedal. And I think, I think uh, sporting Kansas City fans would, will probably attest to the fact they watch a lot more games. I try and watch as many as I can, but they watch a lot more than I do. Um, he probably coaches that team the same way that he plays in that regard. I would say so. I mean, I, I played for him, uh, and definitely there's not a more detail-oriented uh, person, and, and he just – it, he's he's really a, a different level. He's a different level. It was it was great to great to experience that. Um, but getting back to, I just want to talk about the World Cup. I mean, not very few people get to experience a World Cup, especially you know um, one on home soil, right? It, if I could, if I could have drawn the scenario that I wanted in my life to, to play World Cups, like everyone wants to play in a World Cup, right? Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm like dreaming when I'm. 10 years old to play in a world cup. Um, and I think in, uh, in 82, I was 12 years old. I know I just turned 13 when Italy won the world cup and Dino's off, who was my hero, the guy that I wanted to emulate, um, was the goalkeeper. Then, um, the, the, the two, the two places I would have wanted to have played are in Italy and the U S and Italy in 1990 was kind of a warm up. We got our ass kicked a little bit in the first game and, um, and, but that was a learning experience. A bunch of college kids that went to the World Cup. Um, and it's funny, and, and anyone who doesn't know about that World Cup and qualifying, that documentary, that Soccer Town USA, kind of documents all of the hardships going through that and how we finally got to qualifying for the World Cup. And uh, it really is an amazing story for a, a young group of kids. And then, of course, to captain uh, the team at 25 years old in your home country, I, I, I really – I couldn't have asked for, for any more than that. Um, I was the youngest, I don't know if that's still the, the case, but I was the youngest captain ever in a world cup at that point. And, um, I didn't think about it in those terms until after the fact, but now I think about it uh, I, and I sit back sometimes and go, man, when I see video and I see people on social media, put stuff up, I'm like, man, that was pretty cool. But you know, when you're, when you're playing, you're just worried about playing. You're worried about yeah. getting ready. You're worried about, the opponent you're worried about your body trying to stay in shape and, and be as as fit as you can and all of those little things you're not really worried about you know what people are thinking about you down the road <laughs> and how they look at you um because you just want to play and win you know and, and it was just it was amazing and then you know i i, I said after 94 that i wasn't going to play with the national team anymore uh because of some stuff that was going on at home with my family and i said i need to just be closer to home i'm not going to go to europe i'm not going to play i had offers after that world cup i'm going to stay here for the league and that's what i did i stayed close to home um and 
you know, I said, I'm going to get back to the World Cup again. And I didn't make it in 98. And I'm like, uh, now that I look back on it, maybe it was better I didn't make it in 98 with <laughs> everything that went on. Yeah, but, um, that, was a, that was a rough one. Yeah, um, but but then I, I fought to make it back in 2002. Um, and I didn't play in 2002, but I, I was on the team. Uh, Bruce thought that I was the right guy for that job. And um, to skip a World Cup like that and go to your third one, uh, four World Cups down the road is not easy. Um, and that's probably what – that's – I didn't play in that. I'm proud of all the World Cups, but for a lot of different reasons, that may be the most proud I am of being at a World Cup is, is making it after skipping a World Cup. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a testament to the longevity, but you also have a lot of experience with Bruce um, as you played for him uh, at Virginia as well, right? Yeah, I played for him at UVA. And, and at that time, Bruce and I, it's funny, we, we didn't talk because one day after a, a game in New York, um, we played DC, I think it was year two of the league. It may have been year three, but anyway, in the, in the tunnel underneath giant stadium, you know, I ran into Bruce. I said, Hey, good game. How's the family? But he pulled me over to the side. He's like, you know, in Bruce's voice, he goes, I got a deal for you. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> what's that? He goes, trades all worked out. You want to come to DC? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no, nah, I don't really want to come to DC, you know, and, and we didn't really talk after that. <laughs> it was kind of the end of the conversation. Um, but I, I was happy where I was. Uh, DC was a great team. I think I had one moment with Bruce that, uh, that could get me to DC. I didn't want to do it at the time. And, um, but yeah, then it, 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 there was never any hard feelings. Uh, you know, Kenny, actually his son, um, for a period of time, went to school in New Jersey while Bruce was coaching in Virginia at the Pingree School and, uh, you know, needed a little bit of home cooking every now and then. So he, we were living in Princeton. So Kenny spent some time at our place and um, we, we were really close to the family. Uh, Phyllis is a great, a great woman and, and his wife. And, um, you know, down the road, I got to play in a World Cup for him. I, I was pretty thankful uh, to Bruce for giving, really just giving me the chance to get back with that team. Um, and Bruce gave me my hundredth cap, um, in a moment where, you know, I, I think I earned it. Um, but you know, he could have coached the game a different way and, and said, sure. you know, that game in Jamaica and Carolina is yours. You, you deserve this. And I was really grateful, uh, to him for that. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, you're taking me back and it's just like, I'm a kid again. Um, cause I, I remember all this as you're talking about it, but it was really the trade to Kansas city, um, you know, that that really kind of sparked a lot in me as a goalkeeper when you came on. And then um, the, the MLS cup that you won with Kansas city, uh, you know, that you said that yes, the best defensive team, you guys were shelled in that final. I mean, I just remember I was over at a, I was over at a buddy's house. We we're watching this game on TV. You guys absolutely were obliterated. How many, you had like 15 saves in that game. Yeah, so obviously they were talented. Uh, they were they were a, a great attacking team that had a chip on their shoulder because we had gotten the better of them for the most part. But we were in first place from start to finish that year, from day one all the way through the end of the season. Um, and yeah, there were moments in that second half where we were we were under it a little bit. Their team was really really good. But if you remember that team, I'd have to go back and look. I feel like we won nine one nothing games that year. Um, or, you know, we won a couple in the playoffs, one nil as well. And um, we were comfortable in, in those. But we were comfortable yeah, yeah. that all we needed was a goal. We, we knew we had guys like Miklos Molnar who would find a way to score a goal. Keep in mind, we should have been up 3 nothing before, we, b- before Miklos actually scored the goal. Yeah. Um, and then Chicago poured it on in the second half. They came Stoichkov and Kubik came forward and Peter Novak. Yeah. Remember, they brought Josh Wolf. And Demarcus Beasley off the bench at that time. And there were two kids. I believe they just come from uh, from Olympic or Olympic qualifying, and, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, it may have been the '98 Olympics, um, at least the qualifying. And they were getting in with a national team. Ante Razov was there. I mean, they were just absolutely loaded. Jesse Marsh was sort of their number six that battled with Kerry Zavagnin. but that team was okay in that in that position. We were okay sitting back and defending and, and catching teams on the counter. We were actually really good at it. Um, we had some opportunities. Zach 
Thornton made a really big save, I believe, on Chris Klein. Uh, may have been Mik- Miklos, uh, I'm sorry, Miklos in the second half where he put one over the bar, and I thought, man, for a big guy, I remember thinking, man, for a big guy, he's so athletic. I remember I played with Zach was my backup in New York yeah. when he was a rookie, um, and then he left and Tim Howard came um, after that. Uh, so, you know, it was it was a moment that was – it was a special day, obviously, for me and my family and, and for the organization. But um, I don't know that we ever were really uncomfortable sitting back like that. It was just kind of part of that group. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then so you play after that. You're in Kansas City, I think, until 2005. You, you go back to Metro Stars, right? Yeah, they were Metro Stars for a short period of time when I went back and then became Red Bull halfway through preseason. Um, uh, actually, we played, I played one year as the Metro Stars. The following preseason is when we became Red Bull. Uh, Bruce was there um, towards the end, and um, that's kind of when Bruce and mine's relationship kind of ended there. I thought that I was unfairly done uh, not playing in the playoffs that year. I'd come from having uh, uh, MRSA. I got from the locker room and they had to like, yeah, they had to clean the whole locker room. I was really crazy. I never knew anything about this, you know, when I was was growing up right there. Yeah. And, (laughs) um, I I ended up on the bench and I still, till this day, you know, I always used to scratch my head and why he made that decision. And he just said, I had a feeling and, uh, actually it was Richie Williams was there before Bruce got there. Uh, before he actually took over the job after the World Cup. And, and then that, that was pretty much it. I played a year of indoor after that, which I, I absolutely loved. Um, I loved uh, playing so much. It was like so much fun. Coming back out, isn't it? What's that? It's like the kid in you coming back out. It, it is. It really right. is. Um, and uh, now I, I don't play at all. I just kind of <laughs> watch games, and it doesn't hurt when I watch games. <laughs> Well, yeah, I will say one of the coolest moments, I don't, I mean, I don't know if you remember this or not, but uh, I was, when you, before you left um, for, for Metro Star slash Red Bull, um, I was about to, I was invited to the MLS Combine. Mm -hmm. I Um, remember, yeah. Yeah, and and I had the opportunity to train with you leading up to that, Um, and that was a really cool moment for you, and I've always appreciated that. Um, And uh, I, I can remember you saying, I think, I don't know if you know this, but this guy is going to be really special. I remember you saying this is going to be one of the best goalkeepers you've ever seen, right? Uh, I think that's exactly the words that I used. That that, that was it. Um, I'm hoping at some point I gave you some words of encouragement. I hope you learned something, uh, even if it was just uh, uh, playing with your feet or something, something about training. That, that's I for sure. Remember, I just remember you pinging these balls at me, and I was just like, man, this is – this is so cool, and yet uh, I was I was pretty intimidated. But I could tell, I could talk to you all day. Um, seriously, there's so much more that I just can't believe you've actually. That, like for instance, you were in I think you were in a band, and also did you do an off Broadway show? Is that I did? Uh, yeah, 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 I did. See, it's I part can... of uh, the promotion of of soccer back in the day. I was I played Tony and Tony and Tina's wedding and off Broadway in New York. It was. Uh, one of the coolest things I did one off season. It was a, but back then, if you remember that, that play, um, it was, it was also like, it, it was one of those plays that celebrities played that role all the time. They always had a celebrity. Lee Mazzilli was the first one to do it. He was playing for the Mets at the time. A bunch of guys had played um, stuttering John from the Howard Stern show. Like that was something that you did. Um, if you were like a celebrity that people in New York knew. So it wasn't so much about the play. It was more about the rest of the stuff and um, sort of being a New York, uh, growing the sport in New York and being a personality in New York in that metropolitan area, which was the coolest part. You know, the band, I would played the drums my whole life uh, awesome. from the time I was like 10 years old. My mom and dad hated it. I loved it. And uh, a bunch of guys that I played soccer with in high school were great musicians. And we played for, for five or six years we actually did an mls all-star game in orlando they flew everybody down it was wild um i did the old i don't know if it's still there in kansas city we flew the band out or uh, not sporting uh the kansas city wizards flew the band out for a night at the hurricane in kansas city i don't know if that bar is still there i don't think the hurricane's there uh anymore i but then again you know those weren't in my primitive years of of going out so i was elsewhere so yeah that was mine and alexi's hangout was the hurricane live bands 
but definitely no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff was cool. Um, I look, I just, it was one of those guys that said, I don't want to be, you know, 80 years old going, you know what? I should have done that when I had the chance. It's not like I, I wasn't breaking rules. I never went out on the road. I wasn't that guy. I, I traveled with a book bag. I only needed a book bag to carry all my clothes. I didn't go out after games. Um, I was always meeting family in a hotel. Like those were my outlets, you know, now it's, now it's fishing. Uh, it's been fishing for years and years since I was in Kansas city where I started bass fishing. And now we fish out in the ocean. Um, uh, that that's what I love to do. That's my release because I spend time with my kids. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, like I said, I could talk to you all day. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. You know, and and I hope you stay safe during this time, and we get out on the field uh, sometime soon. Not yourself, of course. Um, you, I'll get out there. I won't do anything. I can <laughs> go out to the field. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm pretty much to that point too. Too many injuries. I, if I do anything, something's gonna snap. So. Um, but, yeah, stay safe. I really appreciate the time and, and wish you the best. Andy, appreciate it, man. All the best, and you stay safe, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thanks so much, man. Thank you. Take care.